get all this uh, technology things to work here, that'd be great. Just want to introduce um, our entire family. My wife just went out with the junior church kids. She has a missionary story to tell them, but uh, um, that is my oldest son getting married this past summer. Uh, it was the first, uh, our firstborn, um, and he married a a young lady from the Waterloo Church, Walnut Ridge Baptist Church in uh, Waterloo, Iowa. And we're thrilled with them. Ronnie's a graduate of Faith Baptist Bible College and is serving in uh, Community Baptist in uh, Ankeny uh, in their youth ministry. So we're excited to see what, what God's going to do with them. I'll have to turn around because otherwise I'm going to get this crazy uh, thing going on. Um, this would be my second born son, Aaron. Uh, Aaron is about three classes away from a two-year Bible degree from Faith Baptist Bible College. He's a registered nurse. He works in an emergency room in West Des Moines. And uh, about a year ago now, he was able to go on a missions trip to Cambodia. Uh, they saw 450 patients that um, walked to the clinics. Um, and uh, my son had the privilege of, of cleaning the feet of a leper who's sores on the bottom of her feet went right to the bone um, she has rotting feet just to put it bluntly and she needs to lose her extremities uh, to save her life but in a culture where you walk everywhere that's not going to happen she's 40 years old she's never heard of jesus never heard of the gospel uh, through an interpreter my son was cleaning her feet and sharing with her the gospel that's the most important message she'll ever hear in her lifetime. We, we hope and pray that she has accepted the Lord, but um, God used that in his life. Um, about the same time, he switched uh, tracks. He's in a medical track now, studying to be a doctor. Um, he's in his pre-med and um, hopes to um, um, be open to ministry if that's where God calls him. If not, uh, he'll use the medical profession as his ministry and uh, I won't go into a lot of it, but he works for a religious hospital, I'll put it that way, and uh, he's able to pray with patients if he uh, so chooses, and that door is open. He's also uh, um, able to answer questions, and uh, he has had the opportunity to lead one of his patients to the Lord, and um, we just look forward to see what, what God's going to do in, in Aaron's life. Uh, Elizabeth just got engaged last fall and is going to be married this June in Sox Center, uh, marrying a pastor's son from Florida. And uh, so that's kind of a nice thing because now we have a vacation spot in Florida, right? Um, and, you know, Florida in January is wonderful, uh, I'll just say. Um, but at any rate, um, she's a graduate of faith as well, and uh, we look forward to what God's going to do in their lives, her her. Fiance is in a business degree from Liberty, and uh, we'll see what, where, where that goes. Uh, Jacob and Stephanie. Jacob is 17 and still at home. Stephanie is 16, going on 25, and is still at home. Uh, she's our afterburner child, if you know what I mean. Uh, Jacob is the tallest of the family and very proud of that, um, six foot three. And um, so they travel about 50% of the time with us. We attend First Baptist Church in Creston, uh, wonderful youth ministry, wonderful church uh, ministry, and we want our kids to connect with the church and the ministry there. So we have told them you will travel about a half, 50% of the time. This happens to be one of those weekends they are not traveling uh, because of a, a youth function, a youth activity that they uh, were attending. So that's our whole crowd right there. Um, I, I just want to say uh, a word about uh, praying for missionaries. Uh, one of the things that you can pray for missionaries for is safety. Um, since going through Baptist Missions Candidate Seminar, we've had three accidents, um, all of whom have been people aiming at us, okay? This one was a 80,000 pound semi. As we were stopped on, this, on the interstate behind a semi, because there were two jackknife semis in front of them. And as I was sitting there going, I don't really feel safe right now, um, I started to move to the right shoulder and my daughter looked out the back window, my daughter who's engaged and her fiance was in the back of our minivan. Uh, she screamed and it was a microsecond and the semi hit us. As you can see, he barely got us. 
That was enough to launch us into the ditch and uh, all of us had whiplash, three of us hit the ceiling. Um, we totaled the van, it, bu it bent the frame. Um, we really believe that uh, uh, a number of things had to happen right uh, in order for us to uh, not be killed and he could have just as well pancaked us into the, the semi in front of us. So as you pray for missionaries, pray for safety. Uh, I was telling the church this morning, um, an ABW missionary gave his life this week. Um, he was in uh, Togo in a medical missions uh, hospital. He was, the lead, he was the administrator of the hospital, and he died of, of uh, uh, this, uh, an infection, not an infection. He died of malaria and complications to that. Um, four children, oldest 13, four boys, and a wife um, that uh, are just amazingly looking to the Lord right now. But uh, people do give their lives for the cause of Christ today. Um, we uh, had the opportunity a year ago to Skype uh, through a missions conference a Baptist pastor who's in Damascus, Syria, you ever heard of that place? Um, who is uh, uh, reaching people for the Lord, and he told us through at 4.30 in the morning, his time, on a battery-operated Skype machine that he was using, he said, there isn't a family in our congregation that has not lost one member to ISIS. Imagine that. And then he said in the next breath, there were 30 Christians that were recently slaughtered by ISIS, but the gospel is going crazy. Isn't that tremendous? As the devil tries to stamp out the gospel, the seed of the gospel is often the blood of the martyrs. And um, uh, we have seen that over and over. So don't, don't begin to think for any moment that people are not giving their lives for Christ. They are. And... Um, we happen to live in a 330 million people bubble called the United States of America in a 7.2 billion people world. And so don't think for a moment that the world is the United States. The world is not the United States. The world is a much bigger place than that. And if you've had a chance to travel outside of the United States, you, you understand the privileges that we enjoy. But to whom much is given, we know the rest of that verse, don't we? Much is required. Well, I want to share uh, with you, if we can get this technology to work this morning, uh, just an eight-minute video. Who are the Hemsworths? How did we get from a 20-year ministry in uh, Sock Center, Minnesota, to now on deputation, raising support to go to a place called Missionary Acres? And we'll go ahead and play that video right now if you can. Do I click it? I click it, don't I? The story of Missionary Acres starts with the life of Charles Emerson. Charles was reared in a rural farm in Iowa in the early 1900s. As soon as he reached adulthood, Charles forsook responsibility by hopping on trains and living the life of a hobo. <coughs> As a boy, he recalled at least two occasions where his heart was convicted by sin. Finally, after many wasted years, Charles heard the message that Jesus Christ died for his sins and that he could receive forgiveness through faith in him. Charles embraced that message, and the Lord saved his soul. After becoming a Christian, Charles believed that God had called him into the gospel ministry. He became a traveling evangelist and ended up in Missouri. After several weeks of revival meetings, there were so many people that had placed their trust in Christ that Charles decided to stay in the area and establish a church. By faith, he purchased some property, built a church building, and continued to reach out to the local people. One of Charles's dreams was to build a special place where missionaries could retire. As the years went by, Pastor Emerson realized that his dream would not be fulfilled in his lifetime. In 1962, he graciously donated the property, which he called Missionary Acres, to Baptist Missions. Since then, dozens of missionaries and other Christian workers have made Missionary Acres their home. Nestled in the forested foothills of the Ozark Mountains, Missionary Acres is located in southeast Missouri, near the population center of the United States. In a 63-acre park-like setting, the Acres provides individual homes for retired Baptist missionaries, pastors, and Christian educators. These soldiers of the faith have served the Lord on the front lines around the world. 
Retirees can choose a lot on which to build a new home or select from available ones. Because the full-time staff members raise their own financial support, this retirement option is very affordable. Residents enjoy many amenities such as an exercise room, a 25-acre park with a half mile of sidewalk, wooded nature trails, miniature golf, a three-acre lake stocked with fish, and much more. Visitors are always welcome and can be accommodated in one of the guest suites. There are also recreational vehicle sites available with full hookups. At the same time that Missionary Acres was beginning, across the United States in the desert of southeast Washington, I was born to Ron and Margaret Hemsworth. As newlyweds, my parents had come to know the Lord through the outreach of First Baptist Church of Pasco. From a young age, my brother, sister, and I heard the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins and desired a relationship with us. At age five, while attending a Bible club held in our home, I put my trust in Jesus Christ to save me from my sin. Three years later, I was baptized by immersion and became a member of the church. During my adolescent years, I became increasingly convicted of my lack of dedication to Christ, especially in the area of evangelism. As a high school junior, I responded to a public invitation during revival meetings. At this time, I made a decision to completely surrender my life to the Lord. I believe that this is when God called me into full-time ministry. After high school graduation in 1982, I enrolled at Faith Baptist Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa to study pastoral ministries. I was the fifth of seven children born to Wilfred and Rachel Lobb in Virginia, Minnesota. My childhood years were spent on our family farm. My parents were born again Christians and I thank God for my family. As a young girl, I responded to the gospel. At the time, that was an easy decision for me to make. I understood that I was a sinner and needed a savior. The spiritually significant events of my teen years occurred when I was 18 years old. From my perspective, these were more difficult decisions than my salvation. The first one was when I took a public stand as a follower of Jesus Christ by being baptized by immersion and becoming a member of Lakeland Baptist Church of Gilbert, Minnesota. The second spiritual decision came when I made a dedication decision at a retreat. Soon after this, I enrolled in a two-year secretarial program at Faith Baptist Bible College. During my sophomore year of college, Joy and I met and soon began dating. Our relationship grew and we were married on August 10, 1985. We attended college together our last year as married students and graduated in 1986. We then moved back into my home state of Washington where I attended seminary. From there, I became the youth pastor at First Baptist Church of Clarkston, Washington. Our first two sons, Ronnie and Aaron, were born during that ministry. We then spent several years in Hillsboro, Oregon, where I pastored Community Baptist Church. Our daughter Elizabeth joined our family during that time. God moved us back to Minnesota in 1994 to be the pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Sock Center. Sock Center is an agricultural community of 4,000 people and the church and town seemed a perfect fit for us. We bought our first home and settled in and hoped that God would keep us there for a long time. God blessed us with two more children, Jacob in 1998 and Stephanie in 2000. People came to know the Lord and were discipled in their Christian walk. The church grew and matured and we were blessed to have wonderful, godly families in the congregation. Joy homeschooled our children and I served in the community as a police chaplain and a part-time EMT. In recent years, Joy served as our part-time church secretary. In June of 2013, our family was introduced to the Ministry of Missionary Acres. Ron and I led a volunteer church work crew of teenagers and adults there. During this week, we painted porches, re-roofed buildings, and poured a cement garage floor. The resident administrator, Ken Moon, and his wife, Lynn, shared with us the rich history, unique focus, and the ministry philosophy of Missionary Acres. One afternoon, we divided up into small groups and visited some of the residents in their homes. Soon after we returned home from the trip, we felt that God might be leading us to join the full-time staff at Missionary Acres. Nine months later, another visit with our entire family confirmed to us that God indeed was directing us to this ministry. 
we made application with Baptism and Missions and were appointed as missionaries to Missionary Acres in July of 2014. The need for additional staff has been a prayer request at Missionary Acres for 10 years. We believe that God has called us to be part of the answer to this need. We are trusting God that He will use our ministry experience, office and technical skills, emergency medical training, and maintenance and construction capabilities at Missionary Acres. In addition, we will be traveling representatives, recruiting volunteers, connecting with potential residents, and sharing the ministry of Missionary Acres. Just as it is proper to honor and care for our military veterans that come home from America's wars, it is fitting to care for our heroes of the faith who have fought well in the spiritual battle. Over 80 Christian workers have lived at Missionary Acres over the past 50 years. The pioneer missionaries who first lived there labored to clear the land and build homes. Through the years, God has supplied missionary staff and countless volunteers who have served faithfully to provide this amazing place. Will you consider partnering with us by praying that God will provide our financial support? We are asking God for an abundance of individuals and work teams that will assist with maintenance and construction projects. Our prayer is that Missionary Acres will continue to grow to more effectively meet the needs of retired Christian workers. Galatians 6 verse 10 states, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. God has given us the opportunity to serve the household of faith at Missionary Acres. Will you join with us in this endeavor? It is a privilege to tell you about Missionary Acres. I would love to be able to talk with you uh, for hours about it because there's a lot to say. Most, most importantly, I just want to extend an invitation to you as an individual or a family or as a church ministry team to come. And if you're ever in southern Missouri or you want to send a ministry team, we would welcome that. Um, call Ken Moon, who's the director, ahead of time. We'll put you up in a motel-like housing, beautiful housing. And uh, as I said in Sunday school, no timeshare sale. Just, uh, just, just there to, to let you see the ministry. You can stay for one, two, three days uh, just to, if you're pulling through. Um, and if you're there to serve, uh, some folks serve a few days, some serve a week, some serve a month. We have some folks that come and serve all summer. Um, we have people that come and uh, serve. And that, that volunteerism is really how Missionary Acres can exist. Um, it is the lifeblood of, of the building and construction that takes place. Um, and that, that's a wonderful thing to come together as churches and provide uh, a, a, a place where ministers and uh, full-time pastors, full-time Christian workers, full-time missionaries can retire to. And as they say in retirement, make sure that your house is paid for. We are basically taking that off the table for our full-time Christian workers and saying, whatever nest egg you have, consider using that in the ministry that God would have you to do. These are highly trained, highly accomplished people that have been all over the world serving the Lord. And you know what? In retirement, they have not stopped serving the Lord. Um, we, we really have some incredible things that take place. Uh, I shared with the church this morning in Sunday school, we have a youth group of 15 uh, teenagers. It has run that the entire time I've been acquainted with the ministry, and um, they, they bring uh, them to camp. They have two weeks of camp every year. Many of you may know Jerry and Sandy Harris, who pastored uh, near here uh, in um, Brownsdale, and uh, they are there this past year. Ken Moon said to Jerry and Sandy, now, Jerry and Sandy, we really have a need at camp this year. We have a need of a godly grandma and grandpa who will come love on the kids for a whole week. Could you do that? And they said, yes, we could do that. And so they came down, and these are kids that, I mean, the homes, if I were to show you pictures, and it's incredible the, the things these kids are coming out of. Uh, for decades, Missionary Acres has ministered to the kids of the Hill people around Missionary Acres. So 
Um, <clears throat> it's, it's an incredible opportunity uh, for you to be a part of something that is missions. Um, I'm going to send our sign-up around. A lot of times it's missed in the back if it's just in the back. Uh, but if you would like to be on our prayer list, we have over 1,000 people now on our prayer list. Uh, if you would like to be a part of that, we can email it to you. If you don't have email, just give us the whole name and address. We'd be glad to mail it to you and uh, solicit your prayer support. We're at 24% support. When we are at 100% support, we're going to move to the ministry and start working full-time. And um, we'll just let you, if, uh, if you don't sign up and you're interested in the ministry, missionaryacres.com can give you a lot of information about it. All right. There we go. Let's take our Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I, I really can't think of a greater life illustration of spiritual things than the subject of life and death. Dead or alive. I, I shared in Sunday school that I, I've worked um, on an ambulance now. This is, I'm in my eighth year. I'm serving at, uh, in southern Iowa on an ambulance service. I'm only an EMT, but we were a BLS, Basic Life Service Ambulance in Sox Center. We had about 1,000 runs. Um, I had about 1,000 runs in the seven years I was there. And I uh, also served as a police chaplain for 11 years, writing weekly with police. And since doing those things, I have never, ever in my lifetime been exposed to death like I have in those, in those years. Um, on 9-11, the week of 9-11, we had a, a young lady that was coming to the church, um, and she, she, was, she had made a profession of faith in Christ. And, and as teenagers go, that they're not a part of the church family, and in other words, their family don't, don't come to the church. It was kind of touch and go, ups and downs, but our, our youth ministry and our church was ministering to this young lady. And uh, the summer of 9-11, uh, she was just starting to really take off. She was growing in her walk with the Lord. She was in her Bible. She was really, really starting to shine in, in her witness to her friends and the, even to her parents and the things that were going on. The week of 9-11, the week of September uh, 11, 2001, was a 9-11 for Jolene. She woke up at about 3.30 in the morning and there was smoke in her house. And her parents were working that night and were, were not there. And so she loved her pets and she, she made a fatal decision that night. And she decided that she was going to save her pets uh, at, at, before getting out of the house. Firefighters found her lifeless body at the back door with her lifeless pets. And I remember getting that phone call and the youth pastor and I going to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. And uh, I remember walking in the hallway, and as soon as the door opened to the hallway uh, leading to the room where she was, I could smell smoke. And um, just a little aside, folks, uh, house smoke will kill you very quickly. You need to get out of the house. And that was something that she did not understand. And uh, I can tell you that she was not prepared for that night's fire. But I can also tell you that she was very ready for heaven. She was ready for the eternal fire. And, um, you know, as I looked at her, she's not supposed to be dead. When you look at young people, they're not supposed to be dead. They're supposed to live a long life. And I can tell you that that isn't always the case. In fact, uh, I think death is, is, an, is, is an illustration in our world of sin and its consequences. And I think God uh, brings us face to face with death. And probably, you know, many of you in this room have not only encountered death in your family, but perhaps somewhere, someone uh, very close to you has died recently. And you've encountered that contrast between death and life. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning, and I want to talk about this question, are you ready 
are you yourself already for death? And the, really the question is, are, are you alive or are you dead this morning? If you have your notes and you're going to take notes this morning, um, there is a sheet of paper in your bulletin and everything should be on the screen that you're going to need. But the first uh, question that I'm, I'm, I'm asking is, uh, are you dead or are you alive? And I'm, of course, I'm talking now not physical death. I'm talking about a spiritual death. And I'm talking about what God has to share with us in Ephesians chapter 2. Folks, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I know we, as preachers, say that a lot about passages of Scripture, but I honestly go to this passage a lot to remind myself about what God has done for us. Notice Ephesians 2 with me. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Well, if you go back to the major point, the major problem that God sets forth is that man is spiritually dead. You were not born a Christian. I was not born a Christian. According to the Bible, we were born dead in our trespasses and sins. We were born with a sin nature that causes us to sin. And before we ever committed an act of sin, we were a sinner. According to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Way before you were a sinner committing acts of sin, you were a sinner by nature. You were born in this world lost. You were born in this world dead. And I, folks, I've been around a lot of dead people, and I have yet to see any of them come back to life. Now, sometimes in the medical world, you, you might hear somebody say, well, they were gone, and we got them back. Eh, that's not really true. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when the life is gone, it's gone. It's not coming back. Now, there might be times of resuscitation where the life is not gone and we have a chance to resuscitate them and praise the Lord, that, that sometimes happens. But dead is dead and alive is alive. And God says that you and I were born with a major problem and that is we are spiritually dead. That's how we were born in this world. And notice it says, and you, he made alive. If you're going to be spiritually alive, it's going to take an act of God and a work of God in order for that to happen. And anybody who calls themselves a born-again Christian is confessing that they are now spiritually alive. Now, again, on an ambulance, when you're in the back of the ambulance and you're going to a call, you are 911 at this point you are the one expected to make a difference in that moment. And on this particular call, we were going to an accident in town, 30 mile per hour zone, and we were being told that there might be a fatal in the accident. And I can tell you that what's going through your mind in the back of the ambulance is, Lord, let me make a difference today. And in this particular scene, I'm not, I'm not breaking any HIPAA violations. Health Insurance Portability and Privacy Act, uh, for you healthcare people out there, because I'm sharing everything that was in the newspaper. Because the reporter got to the scene first and took a bunch of pictures and reported on the story. And uh, I said, I, I would like one of those pictures for training purposes. And he said, do you want the whole disc? In other words, he took about 50 pictures. So we had a, a, an incredible scene. But this is me stepping off the ambulance, looking at the scene, going, I wonder if we're going to be able to make a difference this day. Well, this is the scene. A 55 mile per hour truck with a horse trailer with horses in the back of the horse trailer and a Oldsmobile Intrigue that ran a stop sign and the 55 mile an hour T-bone that took place. I walked up to the side of that Intrigue and I took a pulse on an 18 year old pulseless dead teenager. And I looked in her face, as I often do in these situations, and I thought to myself, where did you go? 
Folks, if we are not asking those kind of questions, then we really need to get our heads in the game, spiritually speaking. Have you ever had the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody and decided not to, only to find out that they didn't have a second chance? As a pastor, we have those opportunities. You get that phone call, you get that situation, you say, well, boy, I got a lot going on today. I, I could drop everything and go and talk to that individual. I'll do that tomorrow. And early on in a person's ministry, you, you might make that choice and find out you don't have that opportunity tomorrow. They are gone. And you learn in the ministry that when God taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, you need to go and you need to, to drop everything and you need to get to this person's side. You need to pray with them. You need to communicate love with them. You need to communicate that you are there for them. And oh, by the way, if God is in the moment, you need to open your mouth and say, can I share with you God's word? I have never had a person say, if I said to them, can I pray with you? I have never had a person say in a tragic circumstance, no, you can't pray with me. I have never had a person say, can I share some scripture? Can I read some scripture with you? I've never had a person say, no, I'm not interested in you reading any scripture. People in a, in a moment of need are looking for answers. They're looking for hope. They're looking for a lifeline. And folks, it's amazing to know that you as a believer are spiritual 911. You are the rescuer at that moment. You are the person who is going to that person's side and saying, can I share with you hope that goes beyond this world? Can I share with you a Savior, a rescuer, who will deliver you for all eternity? That is the message that we have. And as we look at this passage, we learn that man is spiritually dead. He is separated from God, and he is not going to get that fixed by himself. If you go and knock on doors all around Casson and you say to people, hey, suppose you died today and, and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? You're going to hear all kinds of things people are going to say. I go to church. I got baptized. I take communion. I do good works. I, I, I keep the golden rule. You know, I, 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 I. Well, I want you to notice in this passage of scripture that it isn't found in I. It isn't found in man, it's found in God. God's the one who stepped into man's world and said, I can fix this. So man, first of all, is spiritually dead. He is dead in trespasses. Every hunter knows what a trespass is. Trespass is a line, and you're not supposed to cross that line. If you cross that line, you have broken the law. A trespass is to deviate from the right path. God has a clear line. He has his his spiritual rules, so to speak. You cross that, you're a trespasser. By the way, sin can be defined not only as trespassing, in other words, I can see where I, I sinned, I, 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 I did the wrong thing, but not only that, but the word sin in this passage is to miss the mark. What's the mark? Be like God. You can go to heaven if you're like God. How many, if you ask somebody, how many of you have never sinned in your entire life? I actually have met people that have said I've never sinned, you know, but they don't understand sin. Sin is anything not like God. That's why the scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's like trying to swim the ocean. Yeah, I'm going to, if I, if I'm an Olympic swimmer and the guy jumps in next to me, can't swim at all, uh, I'll get further. But the point is, we're going down, and we're all going down because nobody's going to swim the ocean. Nobody's getting to heaven based on their own merit. In fact, the scripture says, in which we all once conducted ourselves. That means the sphere of our lives, the whole being of our lives, is all about falling short of the glory of God. Next thing is that, as a result, we are spiritually bound. There's a world ruler ruling right now. He's called the prince of the power of the air. His subjects are the sons of disobedience. And the believers, notice it says in the passage, who were dead in trespasses and sins. 
the tense of the verb means there's been a change. In John 5, you can read this, that you pass from death into life when you're saved. From a sphere of death to a sphere of life. John 3, 16, very familiar verse. Notice the tenses of the verbs. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, that's a present, in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It isn't future tense, it's now. If you're saved this morning, you're living your eternal life right now. You have eternal life. There's nothing in Scripture about being unborn. There's nothing in Scripture about how you, are, how you, you go from being a child of God and now you're not a child of God. There's nothing like that. You have eternal life. The Holy Spirit is given to you as a guarantee and earnest that God is going to fulfill His promise. In fact, Philippians 1.6, it's He who started it in the first place and He's going to continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That is eternal security. Social security, that could change. Eternal security, that's not changing. All right? So that is man's problem. He is dead. Now, look at man, the major promise in this passage of Scripture in verse 4. The solution is found in God and not in man. Praise God for that. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, notice the contrast here, even when we were dead in trespasses, Notice you have the great mercy of God contrasted with the great need of man, dead in trespasses and sins. Made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ask yourself, what is it? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Would you notice in this passage that the salvation provided, the major promise is found in the character of God. It is found in the character. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, that is the character of our God. That's what Jonah said when he was looking for God to destroy Nineveh. I knew that you were a God who was full of mercy and long-suffering. I knew that if Nineveh repented, you would save them. Because Jonah wasn't God, and he didn't have the character of God, he was in the place that he was in. God's character. Notice the salvation of God. By grace you have been saved. You could translate that word saved, rescued. You could translate that rescued. The tsunami that, took, that hit Thailand, 100,000 people went into eternity, found a guy eight days later on a, on a tree floating in the Indian, in, in the Indian Ocean, uh, living off junk floating in the, in the water, and uh, no clothes on, and a freighter came along and rescued him. Do you think he understood what rescued meant? I mean, as sharks were swimming around his tree that he was hanging on to, you know, I've got a picture of that that I saved in my, in my computer because every now and then I gotta, I gotta look at that picture and remember what rescued means. You have been delivered. I have been delivered from an eternal death. Jesus Christ has rescued us and delivered us the salvation of God, the glory of God, that in the ages to come, you and I will be displayed in heaven, and God will look at us and say, look at those folks right there. I rescued them. They are the, they are the display trophy case of heaven. That is my grace on display. And the answer from God, how do you get that? Through faith and that not of yourself. And when I was in Sox Center, I think I had a list of 16 things that people were trusting in to get them to heaven, and only one was right. Only one was right. Lots of people trust in a lot of things. In fact, folks, a lot of people trust in their church. Your church may change, but this will never change. Your, your faith cannot be in your church. 
cannot be in a pastor. Your faith has got to be in the Word of God. Your faith has got to be sure. And when you're in those days of the valley of shadow of death, you will not be looking for your church doctrine or constitution. You'll be looking for the tr- promises that have never changed. And the, the Savior who says, it's okay. I'm here to shepherd you through the valley. Lastly, look at the major privilege mentioned in verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, we look at this earthly scene and we look at that ABW missionary, Association of Baptist for World Evangelism missionary, who trained and trained and trained, was prepared to go to Togo, went to Togo, has literally saved hundreds of lives so that they could hear the gospel through that ministry of medical missions, and only in the prime of life to lose his life. And we say, wow, Lord, why? Why would five missionaries lose their lives in Ecuador in the 50s? Why, Lord? By the way, you do know what happened when the five missionaries lost their lives in Ecuador in the 1950s. The ones who speared them to death, that entire tribe came to Christ. We don't know why, but we know who keeps the books. We know who's on the throne. And this scripture says that you and I are literally a masterpiece that God is painting. That's the word workmanship. He is painting your life. Why did God give me medical skills on an ambulance? I was asking myself that a few years ago. I know why now. Why was God allowing me to be bivocational and be a contractor in one of my churches that I took with eight people in it? I know why now. There are lots of things that are going on in your life that you don't know why. But God knows why. He's painting your life. He's making a masterpiece. Why? So that you could be created in Christ Jesus for good works. Do Baptists believe in good works? Absolutely. Not for heaven. Doesn't get you to heaven. But after you're saved, God has ordained you. You are ordained. Yes, you are. You don't have to be a minister or a reverend to be ordained. You're ordained to go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. His workmanship and a walk that is ordained to bear fruit. You say, well, I look at my life and I don't really see a lot of fruit. In fact, I don't see any fruit. There's only two reasons for that in Scripture. One, 1 Corinthians 3, you're a, you're a born-again person, but you're living a carnal life. You're living a fleshly life. You're living a life that's, that's pleasing you. And God would say, Repent. Repent and get right with God. And the other reason is that you were never saved. You were never, you know, a a lifeless person doesn't produce fruit. Spiritual death does not produce fruit. An orange tree produces oranges because it's a orange tree. A Christian produces fruit because it's a, he's a Christian. She's a Christian. Those are the only two things. And if your life is not producing spiritual fruit, you should be looking at one of those two areas and saying, God is wanting me to do business in one of those two areas. Meet Louis Zamperini. Many of you probably have heard of his book, Unbroken, the movie Unbroken. You might not know, as I started this book, I didn't know where it was going. I was just reading it because I'm interested in military-type stories. And I started reading Louis Zamperini's book. He was called The Tornado of Torrents because he moved to California as a hoodlum. And what he, what he did is he stole from people. And his older brother will notice one day just how fast he could clear the scene after he ripped somebody off. And he said, you know, I need to, I need to steer my brother into athletics rather than a life of crime. And so he started, started telling Louis, you need to go out for track. Well, I'll make a long story short. In 1936, he ends up in Germany in the Olympic Games. 
His, his event is the one mile, which is not featured in the 1936 Olympic Games, but it was supposed to be featured in Japan in 1940. And it was going to be, as people were saying, Louis Zamperini would be the first human being to break a four minute mile and he'll do it in the Olympic Games. Well, it was 1936. It was the 1500 meter, it wasn't his event. He was toward the last, in the last lap. He ran that event so fast that he became the first human being to ever run the 1500 meter, the last lap. He didn't finish first, but in the last lap, he finished that last lap in record time. So much so that there was a guy named Adolf Hitler in the stands who wanted to meet this boy and shake his hand. And so Louis Zamperini in 1936 shook the hands of Adolf Hitler. Before he left Germany, he ripped off one of their flags. But that's beside the point. <clears throat> what happened in Germany after 1936 is Europe broke out in war. In 1941, the Olympic Games were canceled in Japan. And in 1941, we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. And Louis Zamperini and all his, his brother and everybody he knew his age joined the military. Louis found himself on a, on a bomber in the Pacific, and on one of those bombing missions, they had a mechanical failure, and they crash-landed their plane. Everybody died except for three people, and those three people uh, spent the next weeks on this raft, just like this one, uh, catching raw fish and birds and, and uh, catching rainwater and trying to survive. You can only imagine, nobody had survived for 47 days on a raft before. And folks, I'm telling you a lot of things that pretty soon you start going, well, let's see now. He, he crash landed his plane and he survived. Wow, that doesn't happen very often. And he spent 47 days on his life raft. One of those three men died during the 47 days. He spent 47 days. On, that never happened before. Man, something's going on here. Well, he was rescued after 47 days, only rescued by the Japanese to spend the next two years in a POW camp in Japan. You can only imagine his health after 47 days. Now he's a POW in Japan. 120,000 POWs in Japan, one third of them did not come home. In the last life of Louis Zamperini, his, his thing that was keeping him alive was a hatred for Matsuhiro Wannabe, AKA the bird the guard who had tortured him for two years, the guard who wanted to break him in front of all the other prisoners, because after all, this was the boy wonder who was supposed to break the four-minute mile. Well, he would confess the thing that kept me alive was my hatred for this guy, and the last thing that these guys were going to do, their suicide mission was they were going to kill the bird, and then they would be killed. And so they had a constructed plan where they were going to kill the bird. And you know what happened? We won the war. And we liberated the camps. And the POWs came home. And, and these men came home. They were broken physically, but they, they were enraged. And they had all kinds of things coming home with. And, and Louis Zamperini sought the bottle when he got home. And he became an alcoholic and dominated by alcohol. And he thought, well, I'll marry a beautiful woman. So he married a beautiful woman. And he thought that would take care of Well, that didn't help either. And their marriage was going south in a hurry. And life was going south in a hurry. And Louis' life was crumbling around him when all of a sudden, his wife decided to go to a Billy Graham crusade. And she came home and she said, Louie, Louie, I have found the truth. I have found the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was saved tonight. And Louie, you've got to come back with me and you've got to hear this message. And Louie thought, all right, well, I'll go. Keep you quiet. So he goes. And when that invitation was given, he jumped out of his seat and he charged out the back of the room and he said, don't ever ask me to go back there again. And he was enraged at the fact that he, given all the things that he had done, needed to be saved. The next day, she invited him to come back to the meeting. Louis, you've got to come back. Please come back. Please, just come back. And Okay, but when that thing happens at the end, I'm out of there. So the preaching happened. The gospel was given. Louis got up just as enraged as he was the night before, started down the aisle, and right there, he stopped in his tracks. And he said, 
for the first time, I have never thought once about all the deals I made with God on the life raft. And he said, they all were reminding me right then and there, Louie, what you need is Christ. He said, instead of leaving in a, in a rage, he came down the aisle. He trusted Christ as his Savior. He was 32 years old, folks. He was 32 years old when salvation met him in 1949. The next year, he goes back to Japan to look up the guards that were now war criminals and in jail themselves to share with them that he doesn't hate them anymore. And from this point on, from his salvation night, this doesn't always happen, but from his salvation night, he never once touched alcohol again. And he never once had a flashback. God had delivered him incredibly, placed him in a place. The next year, he goes to those guards. He shares with them the message that he has discovered. And he leads some of those guards to Christ. The bird is on the loose because he's a war criminal. Louis writes him a letter. We know he got the letter. Because later on, as the story unfolds, the news media caught up to the bird, interviewed him, he refused to meet with Louis. He read the letter. Incredibly, this man lived to be 97 years old. For 65 years, he lived as a believer with a changed life. And what did he do? He started a ministry for the Lord to reach wayward boys just like himself. Folks, just stop for a moment and say, that's the power of God. That's the power of God to change a life, not only for eternity, right here, right now. By the way, in his 90s, he ran part of the torch in the Olympic Games in Japan. And he was still looking for the bird. So God reaches a 32-year-old broken man, delivers him, sets his feet upon a rock, and then that man produces fruit to the honor and praise of God. That's not Louis Zamperini. That's not his smartness. That's called deliverance. That's called salvation. Folks, you have a Louis Zamperini living right next door to you. You have people right across the street from you whose lives are absolutely falling apart. And if you were to get in their homes, you would discover it. You have, we have people all around us who are desperately saying, please, somebody, tell me the truth. And you know what we do? We often say, well, I don't want to be controversial. You know, I, I, I don't want to offend anybody. So I just won't ever say anything. I'll just live the light. God doesn't give us that option. Go is the command of Christ. Father God, thank you so much for the truth of this scripture. Man has a tremendous problem, yes, but there has been a wonderful solution provided. And then you have taken your believers and you have sent them all over the world. Not only across the street and across town and in the schools and in our government, you have sent missionaries and pastors and Christians and you've planted them everywhere. And you've told us, you are my masterpiece. I have created you for good works. I've ordained you to go and tell, to be the example of a Christian before others, but then speak my word to them. And Lord, and when that happens, you deliver people. And Lord, we look at Louis Zamperini's life, who is now in heaven with you as a trophy of your grace and mercy and kindness, and we say, praise God. I'm looking forward to seeing all the trophies in heaven. I'm looking forward to being one of those trophies myself to reflect the praise and glory of your name. Father God, I pray that this morning as we close the service that if there is someone here today and we've talked about death and life, we've talked about being spiritually dead in a time in life that we must become born again, we must trust in Christ as Savior alone 
and believe in the cross of Christ, the death and resurrection of Christ to save us from our sin, that is the only lifeline you're going to send. Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know that message, maybe they, maybe, they were, uh, maybe they were five years old, maybe they were 10 years old, maybe they were 15 years old, and they had made some profession of faith, and, and yet their life never changed. There was no fruit in that life. Lord, may you, you speak to that life this morning. Maybe they're a Christian truly born again, but, but they've been involved in a lot of self-indulgence. I pray that you would deliver them. And then, God, may you speak to the Christian's heart and make us realize that we're the tool in your hand. We're the mouthpiece and we're to go. May you revive our desire to do what missionaries and pastors have done, and that is just to go. We may not all be missionaries and pastors, but we're all ordained to bear fruit. We'll pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We'll be singing verses 1 and 3. God, we thank you for your faithfulness, and we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you for the beautiful message that we heard this morning. We thank you for the reminders of who we were and who we are now in Christ. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, and we thank you for the hope that we have in him that one day we will see him face to face. We thank you for the Hemsworths this morning. We ask a special blessing upon them as they minister to people, as they visit churches. We pray, Father, for safety. We pray that you'll keep them safe on the road. We pray that you'll open doors for them. We pray, Lord, that uh, the missionary acres will be able to meet all of their needs. We pray for the people who work there full time. We pray for the residents of that place. And we pray for the volunteers. We pray, Father, that you'll keep them safe, that there will be no accidents on the, on, in, there on the place, and that uh, this place will continue to grow year after year, more and more, 
for your glory and honor. We pray for the people who are grieving right now, the loss of their loved ones. We pray especially for this missionary family from Togo. Uh, we pray, Father, that you'll comfort the hearts that need to be comforted and encourage those who need to be encouraged. We love you, Lord. We pray for a great lunch. We pray, Lord, that we'll put into practice what we have heard this morning and share the gospel with the people who are in need of salvation. For we pray in the name of Jesus, our wonderful and precious and glorious Lord and Savior, and all God's people say, Amen. Have a blessed day.